Hello. In this lesson, I want to introduce you to a database called the Profiles of Individual Radicalization in the United States, or PIRAS for short. Many of the data collection projects that you've heard about through the START Consortium have focused on terrorism incidents. For example, uh, you may be familiar with the Global Terrorism Database, which deals with events, terrorist events over time. We have other databases that look at terrorist groups, like the big Allied and Dangerous Database maintain, maintained by Victor Assal at SUNY Albany. PIRAS is different than these other databases because instead of focusing on events or on terrorist groups, it actually focuses on individuals who've either been arrested for uh, committing some kind of a terrorist attack or perhaps killed in the uh, process of engaged in a terrorist event of some type. So we wanted to uh, gather the PIRAS data for four main reasons, and I've got a slide that summarizes these that you can take a look at. First, uh, there have been relatively few large-scale quantitative studies of terrorists in the United States. In fact, it's only been recently that any uh, researchers have started to collect individual level data for terrorism in the United States. So we thought collecting PIRAS would fill an important niche that other researchers had not yet really fully responded to. Secondly, there have been very few theoretically informed studies of why people become terrorists or why they engage in terrorist violence in the United States. And so our hope in this research was to start coming up with theories of terrorism in the same way that criminologists have been coming up with theories of why people engage in more ordinary types of crime. And third, uh, there have been few comparisons of different pathways to radicalization in the United States. So we are pretty sure that there are lots of different ways that people radicalize, but there hasn't been a lot of empirical research actually tracing these pathways or comparing them. And finally, there have been relatively few studies that use both quantitative and qualitative data. So with the PIRAS data, we've collected about 1,650 individual case uh, records of individuals. So this would include almost 150 variables, things like uh, their age and their gender, uh, whether they have any history of psychological problems, criminal record, and so on. But in addition to that, we've also been collecting more qualitative case studies, and we have something like 110 of these case studies now. So these go into much more of a narrative about the individual and their past experiences. Uh, so we found this is also a unique aspect of this data, that we have both uh, quantitative and qualitative options. Uh, and I should mention that this project was originally a collaboration between myself, Dr. John Sawyer, and Dr. Gary Ackerman. Uh, who wrote the original grant to the National Institute of Justice to help collect the PIRAS data. So uh, let's turn to the next slide now, which shows the key questions that we hope to address with this database. Uh, we are especially interested in whether we can find differences between individuals that have engaged in terrorism but have been violent versus individuals who engaged in terrorism and have been nonviolent. For example, your only connection to a terrorist group may not be committing some act of violence. It might be your, uh, an accountant for the group, or a driver for the group, or a cook for the group. And quite a few of the cases in our database involve individuals who've been engaged in supporting a terrorist organization, even though they haven't committed violence. A second uh, thing we hope to do with this project is to explain better what the relationship is between beliefs and behaviors. I think when people first started being very interested in radicalization and the concept of radicalization, there was a kind of an assumption that beliefs and attitudes go together in a kind of lockstep fashion, that as we get more and more radical in our beliefs, we naturally get more and more radical in terms of our behaviors. But they seen, we're seen kind of as two sides of the same coin. But as soon as we started doing research in this area, we found lots of examples where it looked a lot more complicated than this. Uh, if you do interviews, for example, with people who've engaged in terrorism in the past, like ex-people from IRA or at the ETA, you quickly find that some of them have very radical attitudes, even though they may not be engaged in terrorism at the moment. So it's not always the case that people with radical attitudes act on them. And we also find some examples uh, of the reverse, where individuals do not seem to have a very detailed attitudinal explanation of why they're engaged in terrorism, and yet they're engaged in it. They might have a relatively loose attitudinal affiliation with terrorist organizations, and yet in, in some ways that are pretty alarming, they may still be interested in engaging in terrorism. 
So we were interested in getting more information about this linkage between radical beliefs and radical attitudes uh, and uh, radical behavior in this project. A third uh, contribution and a type of question we hope to address with this research is whether we see big differences across ideological forms of terrorism. And we're concentrating really on three main groups in the current project. Individuals that are involved in various kinds of left-wing terrorist causes, those engaged in various types of right-wing causes, and those engaged in various kind of Islamist uh, terrorism-related causes. So we're interested in trying to decide whether there are big differences across these categories in terms of the kinds of things going on, the kinds of behaviors going on, and so on. And finally, a fourth question we hope to answer in this uh, research is to figure out which theories of terrorism uh, are most promising in terms of understanding it. Which theories best explain whether an individual is willing, in fact, to engage in violent extremism and violent behavior. Okay, so in the next slide, um, I'm going to show the total number of cases that are classified as Islamist, far-right, and far-left by year in the database. So this is the total number of Pyrus cases by ideology. If you take a look at this slide, the first thing you're going to see, if you look at the sort of big picture, is that the number of total number of cases in the database are increasing over time that we have a lot more cases in recent years than we have from the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, that there's a pretty steady increase in time. This, these results suggest an increasing amount of domestic U.S. radicalization over time. But I hasten to add that this interpretation is quite tricky because these data are based on open sources and the open sources were collected quite recently. It's no doubt the case that part of the reason why you see this upswing does not have to do with the amount of radicalization you're seeing, but with our ability to capture that radicalization through open source data. So my strong hunch is part of the reason you get this upswing is that we're better able to find information on cases that happened more recently. Nonetheless, it does look like a bit of an increase in domestic radicalization over time. If you look further at uh, the cases by their ideology, you can see that the late 1960s and the early 1970s were dominated by actions by the far left. So this would include famous groups like the Weather Underground, some of the Puerto Rican separatist groups, some of the black nationalist groups, and so on, which tended to be very active in the 60s, 70s, and are much less active today. Um, in the 1980s, on the other hand, you see a spike among uh, activities from the far right, and even more so in the 1990s, especially after about 1993. And it's during this period you get a lot of far right activities, such as those uh, made famous by uh, the, the attack on Ruby Ridge. If you don't remember this attack, Ruby Ridge was the site of a deadly confrontation and later a siege. It took place in northern Idaho in 1992. It involved Randy Weaver, his family, his friend Kevin Harris, and agents of the U.S. Marshal Service and also the FBI. Uh, during the siege, Randy's wife, Vicki, was eventually killed, as was their son, as was a U.S. Marshal. This uh, incident received a lot of media attention. There was a kind of public outcry over Ruby Ridge, and this outcry was even heightened subsequently during the siege in Waco, Texas which involved many of the same federal agencies. This ended up being a huge boost for the militia movement in the United States, and, um, and it was sort of part of this, uh, this huge surge in, in far-right activity during this period. Now, if we turn next to Islamist ideologies, we can see, for the most part, they come into the scene uh, after 9-1-1. But it's important to note that after 9-1-1, activity for the far-right appears to stay pretty active as well. So if you sort of look at the big picture, you get a lot of activity from the far left in the 60s and 70s, the rise of the far right in the 80s, the rise of Islamist groups after 9-1-1 with the continued activity at fairly high levels for the far right. So um, the PIRAS data uh, in its current state allows us to start comparing the characteristics of individuals who come from different ideologies. And the next slide will provide uh, a quick overview of some of the things we're learning about differences between these different ideological groups. 
You'll see first, if we look at the Islamist groups, you tend to find uh, cliques more often with Islamist groups. That is, small groups of individuals who uh, get together on a regular basis. This actually epitomizes the groups that uh, worked uh, during the 911 uh, attacks, for example. Uh, Islamist groups, not surprisingly, are more likely to involve non-U.S. citizens. They're frequently likely to involve converts. Quite a number of the Islamist attacks in the United States involve individuals who have converted to Islam. They weren't born into a family that was practicing Islam, but they later converted. They're also more likely to have been recruited by supporters. Recruitment seems to be a very important, seems to be more important for Islamist individuals than it does for the other two groups that we're comparing. Uh, we also find less competition between the various Islamist groups than we do for the other categories that we're looking. If we move to the far left, we see that they're more likely to report a change in performance prior to radicalization. What do we mean by this? Well, for example, you get a poor evaluation at work or you get failing grades in school, that there's often what seems to be a kind of triggering event for the far left that is associated with their individual radicalization. Also, not surprisingly, the far left are more likely to be students, and uh, this makes sense because a lot of the activities, particularly in the 1960s and 1970s, took place on college campuses. Um, if we move now to the far right, we also see some differences in this ideological category. They tend to have the longest period of radicalization. Sometimes uh, they've been involved in, uh, in the kind of far-right movement for a long period of time. They also tend to be more competitive with other groups. Uh, the far-right is distinctive in the sense that they also compete with other far-right groups much more than either Islamist or far-left groups do. Um, we are able with the PIRUS data to now start looking at some of the variables that actually are associated uh, with radical ideologies and allow us to perhaps distinguish between these radical ideologies. And uh, I've got some of these listed on the bottom of this slide as well. We're finding, in fact, that there aren't many psychological differences across these ideological groups, which is kind of interesting because in some of the other work we're doing, we do find psychological differences. But this does not seem to distinguish ideologies. We also find no particular group is more likely to produce loners, that is, individuals who operate on their own as opposed to a group, which is also, I think, interesting in terms of policy. And we might have thought loners would be more common in one of these groups. We also aren't finding big differences in terms of social standing. Uh, these groups are not uh, certainly universally drawn from either poor, middle class, or upper class groups. Um, they tend to be pretty broadly uh, drawn. And we also are not finding big differences in terms of prison experiences, which I think will surprise some. Uh, they seem to be pretty equal in terms of prison experiences. Uh, we can also use the PIRUS data to examine differences between different categories of terrorism. One of the categories that we've been especially interested in is whether the individual acts as part of a group or does the individual tend to act as a loner, tend to act on their own. Uh, sometimes researchers refer to the latter category as lone wolves. So in terms of the, uh, of the next slide, it'll show some ways that we can compare lone wolves to the groups. The basic analysis here would ask essentially what makes it more likely for radicals to act alone as opposed to acting uh, as part of a group. And how do lone actors <coughs> excuse me, differ from group actors? The analysis presented in this part is based on about 1,100 cases taken from the PIRUS database. Now, once we distinguish lone wolves from uh, individuals that act as part of a group, we can ask the question, what variables best determine whether you're a lone actor or a group actor? And we provide some uh, indication of variables that make a difference in terms of this prediction in the next slide. These are predictors of acting alone. And one of the most interesting findings we have here is that having a, a problem with psychological factors in the past, having some record of mental problems or even a mental illness, which generally does not seem to be a big predictor of terrorism in general, does seem to be a predictor of being a lone actor. You can see that uh, a much greater proportion of lone actors have some sort of psychological problems uh, compared to group actors. It also appears, and obviously this is not surprising, that lone actors are different from those that work in groups in a couple of other ways. They are also less likely to be able to maintain 
strong relationships, which obviously makes good sense. That's why they're lone actors. Uh, and part, perhaps a good part of the reason why they work alone. We also find that lone actors are more likely than group actors to have a record of previous criminal activity. And this is a bit different than mo much of the uh, research on terrorism in the past, too, where we find group actors frequently do not have extensive criminal records, may not have any criminal record at all. Uh, so again, a bit of a departure from past research. We also find that lone actors are less likely to be part of a radical network. Again, this makes sense, and this is part of the reason they're loners. This includes uh, they're less likely than others to have a person that defines themselves as a radical, a friend, a radical family member, a radical significant other. They tend to be operating much more uh, on their own. And finally, lone actors are somewhat more likely to have had some type of crisis associated with what psychologists call a quest for significance. Now, in, a, in one of the next uh, sessions, Dr. Ari Kruglansi is going to talk in much greater detail about this phenomenon of the quest for significance. But we can see here that uh, it shows up as a distinguishing characteristic of lone wolves versus group actors. So it could be this person has had some kind of failed aspiration, could be abuse as a child, abuse as an adult, could be being kicked out of the home by parents, could be uh, some type of trauma, and so forth. So you'll be hearing more about this in the future. We can also use Pyrus data to map the total number of lone and group actors over time and then to start thinking about which kinds of variables distinguish them. In the next slide, we look at the total number of group actors and lone actors in Pyrus uh, for a long period of time, all the way back to the end of World War II. First, we see a general increase in individuals engaged in terrorism over time, and we've seen that in the previous slides as well. So in general, we also see that group actors are more common than lone actors. But note that compared to the number of group actors, the number of lone actors is increasing over time. So much so that in one recent year, in 2010, I believe, we actually have more lone actors than group actors. Now this is very important because it suggests that this phenomena is going to be growing over time, but it also is important because lone actors tend to be deadlier than group actors. In some other work we've been doing, we found that lone actors have as much as four times, or are responsible as many as four times more casualties than individuals operating in groups. And in general, what the chart shows is that most of the activity for lone actors happens uh, after 911, rapidly increasing after 911. Uh, we can now turn to some of the differences between lone actors and group actors in a statistical sense. If you look at the next slide, we highlight some of the key differences between lone actors and group actors. And we've highlighted here all those that are statistically significant differences. So again, compared to group actors, lone actors are much more likely to have psychological issues, which we've talked about a little bit earlier. Interestingly, they are also more likely to uh, have radicalized at least part on the Internet. So this concern that uh, as the Internet becomes more and more important in our lives, you might get a larger number of lone actors seems to be supported by this preliminary information from the Pyrus data from individuals who've radicalized in the United States. We also see that they're more likely to have committed violent acts in the past than group actors, and they're also more likely to have had a criminal record. Interestingly, also, lone actors are, are more likely to have had some kind of military experience compared to group actors. Lone actors are also more likely to report what we could call a conversion experience, a kind of aha moment where they radicalize very rapidly, that something uh, really sets them off in a very direct way. Uh, group actors tend to be more gradual in terms of the radicalization experience. So it essentially tells us that when we compare lone actors and group actors, that the transition for lone actors may be more abrupt than it is for group actors. Now we can also compare lone and group actors across ideologies, and I provide an example of this in the next slide. As we saw before, the phenomenon of lone actors appears to be much more important in recent years than in the past. There were few cases in the 1970s and 1980s. We see a big swing in cases after 911. Uh, relatively few lone wolves from the far left, however, substantial numbers of Islamist and far right lone actors. In fact, for the most recent years, after 2009, we find more lone actors from the far right than from either the far left or from Islamist groups.
Okay, uh, I'd just like to conclude this session by pointing out a few important challenges and weaknesses with open source data such as Pyrus. And by open source, I mean unclassified data. What are the challenges, what are the weaknesses of this kind of approach? Well, first off, uh, there's lots of missing data. Uh, for the 150 variables we're trying to record, sometimes we're missing a lot of cases. Getting information from online accounts, from court cases, and from records is complicated. And it's fundamentally different than interviewing respondents. If you think about it, when you interview a respondent, you'll ask them to answer, for example, whether they have a criminal record. They can say yes or no, and it's only missing if they refuse to give you an answer. That's the only truly missing category. But when we rely on open sources on records and do not find information for something like a criminal record, we often cannot be sure if there really was no information or there really was no criminal record, or whether we simply weren't able to get the appropriate information from the available data. So this makes it very difficult uh, for you to tell whether a case is, whether a particular variable is truly missing or just was something that wasn't reported on in the information you have available. We also have greater sensitivity in releasing data uh, when it comes from open sources than from some other databases. In fact, in our own work at the START Center, we've had sometimes had to take out names of even convicted terrorists from our public databases because of privacy issues. Uh, and these issues are multiplied greatly when you want to compare serious offenders with individuals who have no criminal record. You might wonder what the control group is in Pyrus, and the control group is essentially uh, people who have not engaged in violent activity but have still engaged in some terrorist-related activity. It's much more sensitive for researchers to actually try to gather data on individuals who have not engaged in any criminal activity. So everyone in Pyrus uh, is the same in the sense they've all committed a crime. And, and what this means is what we're really controlling for is not, or what we're really comparing is not individuals who've com radicalized individuals who have not. We're comparing individuals who've committed violent acts to individuals who've, com who've convicted, been convicted of com uh, committing something less than violence. Now, we use a similar system to collect information for many of our other databases. You will hear quite a bit about the Global Terrorism Database in these lectures, for example. But I think in some ways it may be easier to collect information from open sources on events or even on groups than it is on individuals uh, because getting detailed information on as many as 150 variables for individuals is sometimes just not possible in open sources. Now, we've just received additional funding from the National Institute of Justice to be working uh, more on this Pyrus database. For example, we hope to be able to uh, add data to the Pyrus data set to look specifically at foreign fighters, uh, at, that is, individuals who've been going to uh, Syria and Iraq and other places to fight for terrorist organizations like ISIS. We are also uh, doing a project that's going to be looking at how individuals who've radicalized in the United States compare to gang members in the United States. So we'll be using the Pyrus data in the future in a variety of new and hopefully creative and useful ways for policymakers. In general, our hope is that the Pyrus data will be increasingly useful as a source for understanding how and why people turn to terrorism. Thanks very much for your intention in this, uh, in this module.